chapter 2, where we'll be studying verses 2 through 17 this morning. If y'all are wondering uh, what happened in my normal opening, I want to spend more time preaching and less time talking. So uh, if you need a copy of God's Word, just raise your hand and we'll bring one to you this morning. Uh, maybe you're like, I forgot mine at home. Uh, take one. Take one and, and give it to somebody else if you don't need one, if you don't have one here today. If you're watching online, I encourage you to go to BibleGateway.com or download the YouVersion Bible app on your phone so you can follow along. I don't care how you get to the Word, but get into the Word. I want you to follow along with what I'm preaching this morning. As I say almost every week, I cannot change anybody's life, and the Word I preach can change anyone's life. And it's that Word I want to preach to you today, the inspired, and there, and follow the Word of God. If you're able, please stand now as we read God's Holy Word, Revelation. Chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Write to the angel of the church in Pergamum. Thus says the one who has the sharp, double-edged sword, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. Yet you are holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death among you where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balaam to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites, to eat meat sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So repent, otherwise I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Let anyone who has in ears to hear or listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name is inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for today. I thank you for being able to be here today to preach your word. I thank you for the house of just believers that are here today to study your word. I thank you for the ones who are online. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for the faithful service of Ben Wright and Lord, just monitoring that. And Lord, we thank you for those who are, are listening online this morning. And I pray that if someone is here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today will be the day of salvation for them, Lord. I pray that we would literally take heart to this message, Lord, that you have given us uh, for our good and your glory. Or may we not just skim over it. May we not just say it's another letter that we're studying. But Lord, see what you want us to take away from this. So Lord, may I decrease now and you increase and you get all the glory as I preach your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I have entitled today's message, Satan's Playground. Satan's Playground. Y'all ready for this? As a, as a kid, I, I would find any playground possible to play on. You with me, anybody else in here? You know, I grew up over there at Florham Hill Park, and I played outside, and then down the street just a couple of blocks, we had another uh, playground that I drove my bike to where I could play basketball until it got dark. And if it was on Saturday, and we were extremely blessed, my parents would take me down to the amusement park of all amusement parks and playgrounds in Columbia Heights which was White Bank Park. I, I enjoyed going to White Bank and playing on all those things, except for that spinning thing that made you throw up every time you got on it. But other than that, I, I enjoyed going to the playground, but there wasn't any other playground that was better than the McDonald's playground on the boulevard. Anybody ever play on that thing? Man, it was so good that you got to actually play on a playground and eat ice cream at the same time. Does it get any better than that? And the kids today, they don't, they don't appreciate it. We didn't have that, like, Jesus Chicken indoor playground that Chick-fil-A got. We had to play outdoors. They had nothing but outdoor playground. And if it was raining, tough luck. That's all you had. And I didn't care because I had ice cream and a playground. So let it rain, church. I was enjoying myself. Kids today, they don't know how blessed they are. That their parents actually pay for them to go to these indoor playgrounds that are uh, made today. What are they like? Jumpology? What else do we got? 
Sky Zone, I don't even know, man. I just know it, it, it just takes money out of my bank account. They just go and they just jump and they have fun. And kids play for this. The stuff that we used to get for free, right? I want to talk to you today about a different type of playground. One that is both outside and inside. And just because it's available to you doesn't mean you need to play on it. I want to talk to you today about Satan's playground. He who has an ear, let him hear the word of God this morning. I want to first talk about Satan's outdoor playground. If you have your Bibles open, and I hope you do, I, I get this from verses 12 and 13. It says, write to the angel of the church in Pergamum. The, Thus says the one who has the sharp double-edged sword. I, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is, yet you are holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death among you where Satan lives. This is the third church in the Letters to the Church series that we're studying in Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3. This church is located roughly 65 miles north of the Church of Smyrna that we studied last week. It was uh, known as the greatest city of Asia Minor. It was a very knowledgeable city. The library alone had 200,000 books in it, even back then. It was a massive town, and as you walked through the town, as you took a quick stroll through the town, you would see these massive buildings, and you would see these palaces all over, and these temples that was built throughout the town, and their, their prize jewel of the town was the temple that was made to the goddess of all gods, so they thought, named Zeus. This temple went 40 feet into the sky. It was a impressive just figure in the middle of town. They also had another proper temple town in honor of Asclepius, which I don't know if that sounds right or pronounced right, but you don't either, so that's what we're going with today. <laughs> he was the pagan god of healing. Matter of fact, the emblem, Randy, you would appreciate this, the emblem of this, of this temple here was a serpent entwined on a pole. You ever know where that came from? You ever wonder where the ambulance sign comes from? It comes from right here in the church of Pergamum. Probably didn't know that, did you? And this is where it comes today. And people would come all over to try to be healed because this was the goddess of healing. So all these pagan rituals were happening in town. And to top it all off, emperor worship is, was expected. Just like last week when we studied that people had to come and bow down and say, Caesar is Lord. Once a year they had to do the same thing in this town. But no Christian in good conscience could do like the believers were found to do in, in Smyrna, they, to bow down to peer pressure and to sit there and say that Caesar is Lord. They, they could not do that. Even it meant that they would be mocked, ridiculed, and lose their jobs. Man, they were under a lot of peer pressure. They were ridiculed so much that they were actually considered and called outcasts of society that were not fit to live on this earth. I gotta tell you, those people who called them that were right. They had a little bit of a point. Because you know, as Christians, our home is not here on earth, but our home is in heaven. We are just sojourners passing through on the way to our forever home. You were not meant to fit in in this world, but to stand out, church. See, with the Greek philosophy that was being taught, the pagan worship that was rampant in the toxic political front, it feels a little bit about like Hopewell today. It was pretty much unbearable to be a Christian in this place called Pergamum. The stage was set for an all-out spiritual war. The, the word acknowledges that was the case in this place called Pergamum. The word says that they lived in a place where Satan's 
throne lie. It was a place where Satan could exercise his influence over a community. It was a place where Satan was having a field day. It was covered in the darkness and a cloud of evil. I have been in places in this world where I just felt the presence of evil. I have been in places where literally, I, when I was writing this sermon, I just thought about some places that I've been to. I even remember the place, man. I remember where I felt like I was standing face to face with the devil. My, my hair started standing up on the back of my neck, man. We have some missionaries here today that can testify to that. There are places where you just go and you, you just know you're in the presence of evil. Have you ever been like that? You ever felt something like that? So we, we, we understand that. We see how difficult it was and in some places to be a Christian. Yet some of the toughest places to realize where, where Satan is just exercising his influence and expanding his playground are usually right where you live. You don't even realize it. You don't even realize the, the subtle changes that are happening and you're just saying and you're just, just checking it off as just part of the times that we live in. You don't even realize at the moment that these subtle changes are being made that they're really in pushing people further and further away from Christ. And before you know it, Satan has this massive playground. Kids today will not appreciate what I'm about to say. But where I grew up in Colonia Heights, and show of hands if you are with me today, we had something called the Blue Law. Yeah. You remember the Blue Law? Yeah. We had the Blue Law. There was nothing that was open on Sunday but the church. You, you couldn't find anything that was open on Sunday but the church. Alcohol sales were prohibited before 12 o'clock on Sunday when the church would let out. I know this because, well... We tried it one time, and they had chains at 7-Eleven on the boulevard until after 12 o'clock. It was part of it. Even the parks in, in Colonial Heights forbid having alcohol in the parks. It felt like there was nothing that could be done in the city without the pastors of Colonial Heights Baptist Church and Mount Pleasant Baptist Church approving of it. Whether or not that is right or wrong, that's a different story. That's just how conservative it was. But over the course of time, because of tax revenues that would bring in, stores were starting to allow to open 24 hours a day. And then all of a sudden, sporting events started taking place on Sunday. But you know what? That wasn't good enough. Sporting events started taking place during church. And as parents, they're put in a tough situation. I only have my kids for a little while. Let them play. And they can do church later. And I got to tell you, as parents, if you see church as optional, your kids will see it as unnecessary. That's bonus material. But this is what Satan has done right underneath of our eyes. These are the changes that I grew up with. So how do you think Satan's throne, <laughs> Satan's playground is being expanded today? How are some ways that you think Satan's playground is being expanded today in his outdoor playground? I think in Hopewell, it's easy to sit there and say that drugs are a huge problem in Hopewell. Some of you do not know this, but Hopewell is considered the opioid capital of the East Coast. We have more heroin, we have more drug problems than anywhere else per capita on the East Coast. It's amazing to sit there and see that. There is hardly a day that goes by in Hopewell without gunshots ringing somewhere in the town. These are easy things that you can sit there and point out that Satan is having a field day. But those are the things that are obvious. And while there's a multitude of things that you can probably sit there in your heart and sit there and see that, that, are, that Satan's having a field day, there's one more that I want to share with you that I would imagine that 99% of the people here today get on and play with every single day. And Satan is present 
in that more than ever. Satan has set up shop on the internet. We no longer have to worry about Satan attacking our kids out in the streets or you at work. Satan is attacking you in your houses with a device that rarely leaves your hand. See, our playground may be different than the playground at Pergamum, but the bully is the same, and his name is Satan. He doesn't want you to win. He doesn't want you to have a peaceful life. He wants to disrupt your life as much as possible. Satan is having a field day on his outdoor playground. So I want to I share with you some, some points that I want you to, to take away before we get into his indoor playground. I want to share some points about the outdoor playground that we need to take heed to. And the first one is that we as believers need to learn from the past, but not to live in the past. So Christians, uh, Christ mentions in this, this verse right here about this person named Antipas. Antipas was killed for his faith. As a matter of fact, uh, they would sit there and, and talk about Antipas and, and how powerful that he was to stand up for his faith to the point that it would cost him his own life. He was no doubt a hero in the church that people looked up to. He, he gave his life for Christ. And I, I couldn't help but think about when I was writing this about a board at the International Mission Board in Rockville, Virginia that has a, a plaque and a person's name for every person who has paid the ultimate price for serving Christ. I sit there and I look at that board and I am just sit there in awe of the people who would serve Christ to the point of death. It, it touches my heart every time I see it. And you know what? You might not ever make it to the IAB. You might not ever get to see that board. But, but I encourage you to study people like, like Jim Elliott, uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, William Tenda. These, these stories will inspire you. I don't look at that board, however, and I don't study these people to idolize them. I hope that I will never make it on that board. But I'm here today to tell you that I will consider it an honor if I did. Looking at people who have paid it all for Christ makes me want to be more faithful for Christ. See, the problem is too many churches today live in the past about the glory days. They sit around at church business meetings and they, they have a picture of it, and they probably don't, but they have a picture of a tip that's up on the, up on the walls. And they're going, remember that? That person paid it all for Christ, man. I know it's been 2,000 years ago, but that person was part of our church. And that's what they sit there and say. They said, Jim Elliott, the end of the spear, wow. Don't, don't live in the past, but learn from it, y'all. There's a harvest field of people who need to be tended to now that, that the future church needs to look back on and say, man, Beacon Hill was faithful. Beacon Hill sat there and pushed back the gates of hell. They had people that were sold out for Christ. That's what people need to see. The future needs to see you being faithful today. See, the crazy thing about Antipas, who in here has ever heard about Antipas outside of Revelation chapter 2? You haven't. You know why? He is not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible except right here. And it sits there and, and, and tells me and reminds me that you and I are just a blink in the history of time. And if people are going to remember you for something, let them remember you for being faithful and sold out for Jesus Christ. I don't care if anybody ever remembers who Michael Moore is as long as they know who Jesus Christ is. That's the most important thing. I am not important, but he is everything. So learn from the past, but do not live in it. Secondly, Christ is aware of your challenges. Christ is aware of what you're going to. See, I love these words. I know where you live. Don't bypass that. I know where you live. Christ is not some 
abstract, uninvolved God who's not into your life, that doesn't know what you're going through. See, so many people have this God that they're trying to reach. We have a God who came down the mountain in the form of Jesus Christ, who paid it all in the cross of Calvary, so that you and I can have a relationship with Him. We don't have a dead God, we have a God who's alive. We have a God who cares about what you're going through in your life. We have a God who said, and that should be an encouragement for you today. So when you go to work and, you, and you're dealing with Satan at work, you ever have the people that sit there and mess with you at work? When you're dealing with it, you know you have a God who is with you. When you go to school, you know you have a God who is with you. When you go to the home and you have battles in your marriage, you know you have God who is with you, who will never leave you, who will never forsake you. The problem is that Satan tries to back you into a corner and makes you think that, that you're all alone. That you can do whatever, that, that you can just write it off. Go to that porn site on your phone. Go, go to the strip club down the street. See, Satan likes to isolate you, but you need to remember that God is with you, and He is greater than anything that Satan can throw at you. God knows where you live, church. I'm not halfway through yet, okay? Third thing on outdoor playground before we get to indoor playground is that Christ is in control. You know, I, you may have noticed that I skipped over the introduction to Christ as I as I talked a lot about in the last couple of weeks. That each letter has a different description of Christ, and I didn't skip over it just said because I missed it because I shared with you that those are different. Different, but this identification that Christ uses here. While we sit there and we go through the sword method in our community groups, and it would mean something to you, it meant so much more to the people of Pergamon. Because here's the deal. The proconsul, who had his residence in Smyrna, he actually was the one who got to decide who got to live or die. People saw him as such a powerful influence that, that they thought he controlled people's future by wielding his sword. And here when they got this letter, and Christ sat there and says, I am the one who holds the sword. I am the one who, who is the double-edged sword, who is sharp. He's saying, look, he's letting the church know that he is the one who is ultimately in control. You can't help but go to Hebrews 4.12 where it says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. See, see, the, the proconsul may have had the power of persecution, but he did not have the ultimate power. Only Christ is the wielder of power. He is not the temporary earthly judge. He is the eternal judge. He is in control of all. You can be faithful on Satan's outdoor playground because you know that God is faithful. That, that Satan cannot do anything to you that God does not allow to happen. So I've talked about the challenges of being outdoors. And we go through so much challenges as a Christian today being outdoors. But I want to turn my attention to Satan's indoor playground this morning. I want to talk to you in verses 14 and 15 about his indoor playground. It says, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balaam to the place of stumbling block in front of the Israelites, to eat meat, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Let me ask you a question. If you were completely faithful out in this world, which we know is not possible because we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know that, right? We're all sinners in here. If you were completely faithful outside the church walls, do you think Satan would pack up shop and go home? Not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. Satan may not have been able to conquer them as a roaring lion that is so obvious outside in so many different places around the world. You can sit there and you can leave here today. You can see so much just debauchery. You can see so much things that are happening in this world. So many people that hate Christians and are opposed to Christ. You can see that. That's like Satan just having a roaring lion. You know that, that he is present. But if he can't conquer you as a roaring lion, he will try to conquer the church as a, as a deceiving serpent. See, the church of Pergamon was commended for their faithfulness on Satan's outdoor playground, but they were being rebuked for their indoor playground. What was happening inside of the church walls? Some of Satan's greatest work, church, is done inside the church walls. I could sit there and spend time teaching you today about exactly what they went through with Balaam and the Nicolaitans, but that won't mean 
as much to you as it did to them. Basically, he was rebuking them for allowing people who distorted the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ into the church and those who did not take uh, their morals seriously in the church. They were making a compromise on the moral. In short, they had an open door policy and stayed silent on issues that might offend someone in the church. Satan was using this to dilute the faithfulness of the church and the witness of the church and allow Satan to expand his influence to inside the church. This, this is huge. This, this is huge in the attractional church today. Do you know what the attractional church is? This ain't one of them. The attractional church will do anything and everything to expand their churches at the expense of expanding the kingdom. H.B. Charles says it like this. In leaning over to reach the world, the church has fallen in. We are not considered an attractional church. I could share some with you locally and nationally, but I don't think that's wise for me to do today. I thought about it. But I don't think that is wise. So some people would say, Pastor, don't you want everybody to come to church? Don't you want as many lost souls to come into these doors? Yes. Absolutely. I think we have proved that in the first five years of this church. But I will never do it at the expense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will never back down from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ based on anyone's opinions. I will not compromise the God gospel to simply have more numbers in this building and to open up the balcony. The word is the only opinion that matters, church. If I know that if I please God, it doesn't matter who I displease. And if I displease God, it doesn't matter who I please. To quote Ray Kendrick, may we be as narrow as God's truth and as broad as God's grace. Just as I did with Satan's outdoor playground, I want to share with you some things about Satan's indoor playground. On how he has a field day within the church. He has a field day doctrine. See, we keep a pretty narrow scope of what we do and what we teach here at Beacon Hill. I, I hear a lot of people going from one book study to one book study. Our books are limited to the 66 that are in this Bible. Amen. This is what we preach on Sunday morning. We go verse by verse to the Word of God. We study God's Word. I sit there and I sit there and I, I, I email out sermons that I preach. I want to be held accountable for what I preach. I want you to keep your Bibles open as I preach it because I want you to see what I'm getting and where I'm preaching from. They're, lo they're open for anybody and everyone to ask questions. So what we teach here is an open book to, for, our, for our growth and accountability. And I think that's important that we, we do that to stay as doctrinally sound as we can. We do that also in our community groups where we go through um, Daniel. Y'all join Daniel in community groups? And guess what? We're going to be studying James after we're done with Daniel. We're looking forward to what God's going to do there. But I've found how difficult it is to stay doctrinally sound by pastoring my last church. There was some great people in my last church. There were some great teachers in my last church. There were some great leaders in my last church. But that doesn't mean that Satan did not use some people as plants to try to distort the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ in that church. And I want to give you some examples. And I don't do this to bash another church. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just letting you know what I've dealt with. When I got there, every Sunday school class was teaching whatever they wanted. People were doing different things, and they could teach whatever. There was no oversight. And I found out that our young adult class was, was, um, was growing, and they were doing great. But they had this young adult who was probably in his young 20s at the time who was the teacher in the class, and he was teaching uh, this one pastor, uh, and I use pastor loosely, uh, that had gained a following in the young adults. He gained a following so much that he stepped down from his church to reach a broader audience and started booking places like the Beacon Theater so he could reach other students. Uh, he had these cool videos and this, this teacher, this young kid, was so mesmerized by what he was hearing that he actually filmed videos of him imitating the guy that he was following. 
And as I shared with you before, you should never follow any man. You should only follow Jesus Christ. And I sat there and I studied this man, and I won't give the guy the time of day to mention in this sermon today. But this famous pastor taught that there was no hell and that everyone goes to heaven. Let me tell you something. You can disagree with some things, but it better line up with the Word of God. As long as I'm here, we're going to preach that heaven is real, hell is hot. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and he conquered the grave, and he is coming back again. We will preach that until the devil's So this young, young kid, this young kid wanted to know, just like, not only did he teach him, he wanted to know how he could preach on a Sunday morning. And I said, you know what? Not only are you not preaching on Sunday morning, you're not teaching on Sunday.